Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, guys. A little, little behind today, but that's because of the traffic. But we're going to go ahead and get started. What's that? Want to shut the door? Oh, yeah. If you want to close the door a little like halfway, just so not all the way, but that way people can come in and out, you know. Um, we're not keeping anybody out, but. Reduce the noise. I'll yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that way they don't feel like we're like, no, you can't come in. So uh, it's Apologetics 202. Uh, I see a couple of new faces in here today. And uh, so those of you who have missed any previous classes, you're more than welcome to check it out. Uh, there's the YouTube channel. So all the classes that we've already had are online there. Um, and so this is class number six. All right. And so um, we're going to start with a word of prayer. And so I'd ask if you've got a hat and you're willing to remove it, please do so. And then we'll say a word of prayer. So. Father God, I, I just am grateful for the opportunity, Lord, uh, to come here and just share with my brothers, Father God, build relationships with my brothers and just learn about them and learn about you, Father God, and just, just study your word and your truth, Father God. Lord, I'm so grateful, Lord, for the opportunity to just be your servant, Father God, that you would recycle me after all the failures and all the times that I've disappointed you, Father God. Lord, thank you for your protection in my life, Father. I just see your, your hand moving in my life as I submit my will to you. Father, I'm so, so grateful that you would choose someone even like me. Father, I'm so in love with you. Lord, help us to come with just open hearts and minds to just see your truth of who you are and the, the truth of your word, Father. I pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. All right. Oh, lots of new faces today, guys. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So uh, today, um, so it, for those of you who are new, we, like I said, I have classes online. You can just leave that there. That's one of the microphones. We'll pass it around. I'll have, everybody is going to absolutely need a Bible today. Um, so if you don't have one, please let me know. Uh, there's a couple of them up here, I guess. Here's one. You need one? Yeah. Okay, okay. here. Let me pass that out or give that to... Well, I don't know how many we got Thank here. Uh, I think that might be it. There's oh, there's more over this, on this other side if you if I think if you want one. So we're going to do a lot of Bible reading today. Um, back and forth, I'll, I'll have references and I'll ask for you guys to kind of read with me. So, But before we get started, so this is Apologetics 202. In the past, we went over Arguments for God. Then we went over um, just different prophecies. We went through Ezekiel, what happened to Tyre. We went through Daniel. We defended Daniel. And so today I'd like to read you something. And I'm not actually going to tell you where it's from. So, and well, let me get there just one second. And I'm going to ask you a couple questions about it. Okay. And then we're going we're gonna to get into it. Okay. So, all right. So I'm going to read this to you guys. I want you to pay attention, okay? Right now, nothing's going to be on the screen for you. Just listen, and, and we'll go from there, okay? So, behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up, and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations, Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. And we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opens not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, 
And like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opens not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered he, that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of many people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Anybody have any idea who this is written about? Who's it talking about? Jesus. Jesus. Yep. Pretty obviously Jesus, right? Now, anyone have any idea where I just read from? Mm -mm. No? Proverbs. Proverbs? No? How many of you think it's in the Old Testament, or how many of you think it's in the New Testament? Old Testament. Old Testament. Okay. What would you tell? What, what would you say if I told you that was written over seven hundred years before Jesus? Wow. That was written by. So we're doing it's a prophecy that's not in Daniel. Okay. So there's a hint. This is in Isaiah. Hmm. Seven hundred years before Christ came. So this was in the Torah? No, Isaiah's not part of the Torah. No, just the Old Testament. So even like, well, we're, we're going we're gonna to go over this, but basically Isaiah was written in 740 to 701 BC, right? That's the, the argument of time. So even if you just say 700 BC to make it easy, when was Jesus born? Roughly zero to three AD, yeah. right? So that's over 700 years, no matter how you slice it. Seems, seems to be that you can't really argue <laughs> prophecy when it's written so many years before, right? Now, some people will argue, oh, no, Isaiah was written later, like this was written later. But guess what? <laughs> when we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were from before, right? So it included what's called the Septuagint. So the Septuagint is the Greek <coughs> translation of the Old Testament, mm -hmm. okay? And that was written before Jesus ever came, mm -hmm. and Isaiah was in it, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So... Evidence after evidence. So Isaiah was written in 740 to 701 BC. So this, everything that we're going to read today, 700 years before Christ. Now we read just, we just read through it and we just kind of rushed through it. But, and I think you guys probably missed a lot of really, really cool details. So we're going to go verse by verse. Okay. But before we do, I want to talk about that, right? So it's more than 700 years before Christ. Now, obviously this is about Christ. I mean, you guys even said it, right? It was like, this is about Jesus, right? It, it seems clear when you read it. But some Jews will claim, oh, no, this was about Israel, right? Except that wasn't even a popular idea. Jews didn't even think that until about a thousand years after Christ, right? So the Jews of the ancient times around Jesus' time and older actually thought this was about Messiah, right? So Isaiah is considered the messianic prophet, Okay, so he's got a lot of writings. This is the biggest section that we're going to go over uh, about it. But I have, if you're interested, more, it's homework if you want to call it that. Chapter 42 and 49 is also messianic as well. So if you guys want to look at that on your own, it's really, really cool stuff that you can look at. We're not going to go over that in this class at all. Like, it's not even going to be one of our future lessons. So if you guys want to go over that on your own, feel free. Um, I say that and then, you know... <laughs> 30, 40 weeks from now when we're no longer in the curriculum, maybe we'll, we'll revisit it, but it's not part of the, the currently planned curriculum. So um, chapter 42 and 49 in Isaiah, if you want to look at that. So this, these verses, it says this verse, but this verse section is really about Jesus or it's about nobody. I mean, those are really your only two choices. You can't really say this is about Israel or some other person in history. It's just, just implausible, right? So let's dig in, okay? So we're going to be in, like I said, verse by verse so that we can pick up all the juicy details because there's a lot of really, really cool stuff in here. So Isaiah 52, 13, okay? So behold, my servant shall act wisely. 
He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. So we have here, this is just a summary of about what, what's about to be told to us. Okay. So, and let's break that down, right? So he's a servant, right? So Jesus came to serve us, right? I mean, he, he washes the feet of the disciples, right? He talks about the first shall be last, the last shall be first, right? I came to serve. That's Jesus. But then he acts wisely, right? Everybody knows that Jesus, even if you don't believe Jesus is God, everybody agrees like he was a wise man. Like he spoke things that were wise, right? This isn't even debatable. So then he's lifted up and glorified, right? So he dies, he's resurrected, and then he's glorified. So this is kind of just a summary of what we're about to find out, what the Messiah is all about, okay? So does anyone want to read that for me? And you can, you can take that uh, microphone if you can read that off the screen there. And then there are going to be, like I said, other verses as we go through this that I'll ask people to read. But if you want, um, you don't even have to put it up to your mouth. Just hold it like way down here because it's super sensitive. So, and you can just, if you want to read that for me. Oh, it's right as, there. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred. Marred. Marred beyond human semblance. And his form beyond that of children of mankind. Yeah. So let's break this down, right? So astonished, right? This is throughout the Gospels. Over and over, people were astonished at him and his teaching. Um, if you want to look, you can look at Matthew chapter 7. Okay. Um, has anyone got, you can get Matthew chapter 7. I actually didn't include this one in here. Just thought of it, actually. So Matthew chapter 7, verse uh, 28. Does anyone get that for me? Matthew 7, 28. You got it? Can you pass the microphone back there to him? Yeah. There you go. Matthew 7, what? Matthew 7 verses 28. And if you want, 29 is fine, too. And so it was uh, when Jesus had ended these sayings that, that, that the people were astonished and his teachings, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Yeah, it was astonished. Guys, it's really kind of a cool thing. If you want to go to, like, Blue Letter Bible or any of the Bible stuff online and look up the word astonished, you'll see how many times it's repeated over and over in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay? So his appearance was so marred. You know, Jesus was beaten at least three times, okay? So he, he was beaten by Herod. He was beaten in front of Herod, the king of the Jews at the time. Caiaphas, which was a high priest, and then he was beaten again in front of the Romans. And then, of course, he was whipped, right? And he was given 39 lashes, right? They believed that 40 would kill you. I mean, this is just the, just the beating of the whips could have potentially killed him. But he was also beaten three times. He was actually beaten with his face covered, right? So they covered up his face and then just pummeled him, which I don't know if anybody's ever been sucker punched. Anybody ever been sucker punched? It's the worst, right? Because you don't see it coming, right? It's one thing if you're ready, right? You're, you're in defensive mode. You're like, okay, let's go, right? But it's a whole nother thing to not be able to see it coming. Right? Like that's a whole different thing. So he had his beard pulled out, right? Bits of his beard were actually pulled out. Okay. This was a shameful thing, right? To have your beard just like ripped out like that is it, it's sort of, it's sort of akin to scalping. Okay. So the Indians, right. They would cut your hair off. They would cut your, you know, as a shameful thing. Right. But guess what? It's also really torturous. I mean, could you imagine? Yeah. So could you imagine like, having somebody come up and just rip your beard out of your face and just huge chunks of your skin coming out with it. I mean, that would hurt, right? This is what he's going through. His flesh was ripped off with the back, right? Uh, with the whip, right? He's beyond human semblance. So what does this mean? So then it says he was beyond the children of men, right? Looking So basically what this is saying is if you looked at Jesus after he went through this beating, you would not have recognized that as a human being, right? He was so bloody, so beaten, so torn up for you and for me, if we had looked at him at that time, we wouldn't even recognized it. How many of you guys have seen like The Passion of the Christ or any of the movies like that, right? So what they have there, I break down every time I see it, that Christ would go through that for me, and that's not even half 
of how bad it really was, right? Because they can't put that on TV. They can't really reproduce that kind of level of stuff on a movie. Not really, right? And so if that's going to impact you, think about how much more he actually went through. So let's go to verse 15. Somebody want to read that? 15, so shall he sprinkle many nations, kings shall shut their mouths because of him. From that which has not been told, then they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. Perfect. Um, can we pass the microphone to the next person and get ready for the next verse? And you, whoever's next will just, All right. So you guys see that? Sprinkling. Right? And sprinkle many nations. Guys, we as, as New Testament Christians, sometimes we miss the importance of this. You see, in the Old Testament, right, when they built the tabernacle, when Moses gave them the law, one of the things they had to do in order to make the tabernacle a clean place where they could actually worship God was to sacrifice things, take the blood, and sprinkle it everywhere. Sprinkle it all on the altar, sprinkle it on their clothes, sprinkle it on people. This was a way of cleansing and making things holy. You see, this isn't just some random word he's choosing here. All Jews would have understood this term sprinkling, right? So what it's saying is whoever this is, whoever this servant is, when he dies, his blood will be sprinkled on us to make us holy. This is clearly Jesus, right? This is many nations. This is unusual, right? So there are, you know, in the Jewish culture, this idea that basically the Jewish culture is the chosen people of God. And that is true. But there was sort of this exclusionary belief, right? The Messiah was just for the Jews, right? They all thought that. But here we have a <coughs> prophecy indicating that the gospel was always meant for everybody, not just the Jews, right? It comes from many nations. Okay. Now this is the this is more interesting. So kings will shut their mouth and they will see what that they have not been told, what they have not heard and they understand. Okay, so this is a little complicated. So let's dig into that. So it turns out kingdoms across the planet who had never even heard of Christ and what he did were seen by his people spreading far and wide, and they understand something they hadn't heard about because of his people. Right? So think about it. If you're a king. In that ancient world, right? So let's say 180, 280, right? So this is right after Christ and his, what's happening in your kingdoms? Do you know? So this is right after Christ. What's happening? We're being spread throughout the land. That's right. Christianity is growing. It's expanding, right? So these kings who are from other kingdoms, they wouldn't have known about Jesus, right? Nobody came to them and was like, hey, did you hear about what happened in this, you know, podunk Jerusalem town? about this guy named Jesus, right? They don't care. Like it's, it, these are kingdoms of the world, right? So we're talking like Romans probably knew a little bit about it, right? But let's talk about Egypt and Syria and you know, the, even further east, like into India, right? These guys wouldn't, wouldn't have cared. They wouldn't have known about this guy, right? Because this is the ancient world. It's not like it's on the news, right? They can't just turn on CNN and be like, oh, some dude in Jerusalem got crucified, right? So they, nobody told them, but what they started to see in their kingdoms was the spread of this thing called Christianity, right? And they started to understand things that never even were told to them directly because of the spreading, this natural spreading of Christianity, exactly what was prophesied, right? Because this doesn't really make sense unless you apply it to Christianity in Christ. Like you don't, how do you understand, like how do you see things that you weren't told or how do you understand things you've never heard? This only makes real, like there's only a few explanations and this is one of them, right? And so it just, again, it sort of narrows down who this could possibly be. So Isaiah 53, verse one. Now, a lot of people sort of cut this out as part of the prophecy, but I don't because I think it's super, super important. So can someone read that? And you can just read it right there from the screen. If you can, I don't know if you can see the screen from here. Anyone that you have the mic? Who has believed what he has heard from from us yep and to whom has the arm arm of the lord been revealed yeah it's a little far away <laughs> so, <laughs> so all right you want to pass the mic over to the next person so guys this isn't exactly part of the prophecy but it's more a call to action so this is really cool it's one of the only prophecies where we have 
prophecy. And then it's like, hey, I'm giving you prophecy. Are you going to listen? What are you going to do about it? Right? So this is our response. How are we going to respond to this amazing thing that has been done? Right? So basically, this is the gospel, guys, in Isaiah. <laughs> right? Belief. Right? Who's going to believe? Right? This is in the Old Testament. You know, some people will say, well, it's, you got the Old Testament, you got the New Testament. It's two separate things. They're not really tied together. You know, you get the gospel in the New Testament, and there's nothing about the gospel in the Old, but that's just not true. If we actually look at these things together, we see a consistent story from beginning to end, the, the fall of human beings and the need for redemption through sacrifice. This is the Old Testament over and over, right? They fall and they need some, they need some sort of savior, right? In the Old Testament, it's men, right? But those men fail and they fail and they fail and they fail and they fail. Finally, we get the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate savior in the New Testament. It's one cohesive story. It's one gospel, the whole book. Okay, this is really cool. So the arm of the Lord has been revealed. So who believes Chris is God, apparently? <laughs> Mr. T there. That is supposed to say Christ, not Chris. Okay, that, was, that might have been a Freudian slip, apparently. So <laughs> if anybody who knows what Freudian slips are. This is the arm of the Lord, right? So the arm of the Lord, this is Christ. This, this prophecy is saying, I'm revealing the arm of God, right? So... We're going to go to Isaiah, oops, Isaiah 53, 2. Can you read that for me? 53, 2. Yeah. For he shall grow up before him as tender plant and as root out of dry ground. He has no form or com uh, comeliness. Yep. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we sh should desire him. Yeah. And so that's from the King James Version. Um, this is the ESV that I use here. So anytime I'm teaching, I'm teaching from the ESV, and that's fine. They're, we don't lose anything. It's just some of the words like comeliness is not something we use anymore, mainly because... You want like, me to read it again from my No, day? no, no. No, it's totally fine. It, I'm actually going to use that term comeliness anyway, so that's perfect. Um, like, we don't use that term anymore just because it sounds weird to us. <laughs> like, it's just something we don't use, right? So let's talk about it, okay? So he comes from like, like a plant from dry ground, right? Jesus wasn't well known, right? He comes out of nowhere, right? So this dry ground, this is, you see, there's actually the period of the Bible between like the end of the Old Testament, right? Zechariah, Malachi, until the New Testament. There's about 400 years of space here, right? And the Jews were like, when is it going to happen? When is the Messiah going to come? They were expectantly awaiting the Messiah for a, a reason we'll get into next time. There's actually a prophecy that gave them a timeline, so it's really cool. But there's, they even call it the silent period, right? Where there were no new prophets. There were no new writings from God, right? So this guy comes out of dry ground. He comes out of nowhere. This is Jesus, right? Out of nowhere. He has a humble background. He's a carpenter, right? So he appears weak. He's not like some general, right? He is just a man, just a normal man, okay? At least to what we think, right? So this is no beauty that we don't, like, we don't desire him. Jesus wasn't actually like a handsome man. So it's not some like supermodel, right? Like, I don't know, think of some like, I don't know, Ryan Gosling or... I don't know, whoever, Ryan, whatever his other, the funny guy from, like, Green Lantern and uh, Deadpool and all that guy. Ryan White. Ryan Reynolds, that's it. Ryan right? Reynolds, sorry, yeah. yeah. Ryan. Right, yeah, so I think Ryan Reynolds is a, you know, handsome man, right? Mm -hmm. Like, th this isn't who we're talking about, right? We're not talking about that. This is, one, this is the one thing I think that movies get wrong when they do Jesus, right? They don't just get some Joe Schmo off the street, right? It's, it's always some actor... You know, right? And it's, it's going to be some handsome dude because he's in Hollywood, right? Like, that's how it works. Of course. I wish that they would do that. It would be kind of interesting if they just picked out, like, some random Joe Schmo from the Middle East that looks like Jesus. You know, the next time they do a Jesus movie, that'd be kind of cool, I think, mm -hmm. personally. It makes me, you know, not feel so weird. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus was kind of just like me, you know, just mm -hmm. like you, right? And that's important for us. So, it, now, the word uh, comeliness, right? is replacing the ESV with the word majestic, okay? So this is, it says form or comeliness. There's actually two different things. Form is like physical appearance. Comeliness is like a sense of royalty, 
right? Le like just being uh, majestic, right? And that's why they use the word in majestic in the ESV, like a king from a royal line. Now here's what's really cool, okay? This may not seem like it's important, but guess what? Do you guys know who, without looking up there, it's there, but if you want to cheat, you can, I guess. But who is the first king of Israel? David. Mm -mm, that's the second king. Jesus. Nope. Okay, we can cheat. It's Saul. Does anyone know why Saul became king? He's brutal. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> it's on the screen. No, in reality, the reason that Saul was chosen to be king, and it says this in Samuel, is because he was a head taller than everybody else. So could you imagine, like, we just take a vote, we're like, oh, well, sorry, I, I, we haven't met yet. My name's Chris. What was your Tyson. Name? Tyson? I mean, we met on Wednesday, but I didn't get your name. Tyson, yeah, Tyson is that right? Yeah. So it's like, it's like we just took a, like, no vote. We just decided Tyson was your king because he's taller than everybody else. About your heads. <laughs> right? And that's it because that's where people, like, that's the problem with human beings. When we see a king, we see, we, we, we place, like, our frame on them. What do we value? right? Somebody who's big, who's strong, right? Who maybe looks handsome, who just appears to have kingliness about them, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we do as human beings. So the first king of Israel, Saul. The last king of Israel, anyone? Jesus. Mm -hmm. You see this difference? We started out with what, the, what we want as people, right? This handsome, tall, big dude. And we went to the opposite of that in the last king. Somebody just from humble backgrounds. But that's where their true kingdom is. You see this, this sort of climactic shift from humanity into God, <coughs> right? It's, I, I think this is just a really cool comparison. You know, first king, last king, right? So some Jews thought there were actually two messiahs. You know, this is, this is kind of a side note. And it's so because they expected their Messiah to be kingly, right? Like that's what they, like, I'm confused. Like it's, there's a lot of mess messianic prophecy that talks about he's going to rule, right? He's going to have a kingdom on earth and that kind of thing. So then they're like, but Isaiah says he's going to be a servant. Like, I don't understand how, like, so it must be two Messiahs. Yeah. I was under the impression that the Jews don't believe that Jesus was Messiah. They think they believe he was Correct. a prophet, but not. Well, some Jews don't believe Jesus was the Messiah, but I'm, I'm not talking about Jesus. I'm talking about their belief on Messiah. Yeah, right. I mean, the Messiah is Jesus. We do believe that, yes, but I'm simply explaining that in their, um, some of them had this idea that there might actually be two Messiahs at some point, yeah. right? This isn't about Jesus or not about Jesus, right? Like, this is just separate. As a belief in a Messiah, they thought, well, maybe there's going to be a king Messiah and this servant Messiah is two different things. I see. When you bring up Messiah, I think Yeah, no, no, we do, right. But for them, we like, they don't necessarily associate the two. Now, there are obviously Jews who accept Christ as the Messiah, right? Messianic Jews, and that's awesome. Like, I think that's such a benefit. What's the difference between Messianic and uh, Orthodox Jews? Well, so an Orthodox Jew wouldn't accept Christ as the as the Messiah. Basically, that's the difference. That's the only difference. Pretty much, um, yeah. Like if you, because you can technically be an Orthodox Jew, but also be Messianic. So, so Orthodox what is Messianic, like uh, Messianic new means school or something? no. They just believe in the Messiah. Messianic meaning Messiah. So they believe that Jesus was the Messiah. So and really, it's not ortho. So Orthodox is more. Do they believe or do they? adhere to all of the beliefs and they try to do all of things. So you can be Orthodox, right? But also be Messianic. So really it's Messianic versus Rabbinical. So were, were the uh, Messianic Jews uh, taken out of the church according to so the Messianic, Jews Well, yeah, so Messianic right. Jews and Rabbinical Jews don't really get along. Okay, right. so they were excommunicated so, from that religion. It's not. No, it's not really. They don't have the power for that. But yeah, they don't really get along. Like <laughs> so, yeah. Catholics yeah. and Protestants. Yeah. Like Catholics and Protestants, kind of right. Like it, we can be There's not part reason. of their church, and they can be not part of our church. But it's just more of a separation as opposed to like the Catholic Church doesn't have any authority over me. 
mm. right? And I don't have any authority over the Catholic Church, right? It's just, we're two separate things, right? So do we both believe in Christ as the Messiah? Yes. So are we part of the same church? Kind of. You know, yeah. it just depends what well, depends on how far you go into Catholic Not religion. The same religion. So, well, I would argue that, that that's a different conversation. But we'll, we're going to move on because we don't have time uh, to get into that conversation <laughs> today. <laughs> but at some point, okay? So Isaiah 53 3, who's got the microphone? Can they? Uh, All right, perfect. You want to read that for three, me? Three, he was uh, despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we we esteemed him not. No, it seems pretty self-explanatory. You want to pass that up? He can read the next one. Um, I mean, this seems pretty self-explanatory, right? But I think we missed something really cool about this, so let's talk about it, right? So despised and rejected. Obviously, Jews and Romans despised him. Even most of the world today despises and rejects Christ, right? That's just reality. Okay, so that's, that's the like surface level understanding. Now let's dig into this. Do you understand? He was a, um, well, we'll actually get to that in just a second. So a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. You know that he was in the garden of Gethsemane praying before he got crucified and he literally sweated blood. Gethsemane? Yes, that's the, the name of the garden that he was in. Oh, he literally sweated blood? He literally sweated blood. Now, he knew it was coming. He knew it was coming. Yeah, absolutely. And he did it anyway. Crazy. Yeah. So this is actually, so here's the thing for a long time, people are like, that's crazy. That can't happen. That's impossible to, to sweat blood. But guess what? It does. You, it, can, literally it, do you can literally do it. And do you know when it most often happens? When people are on death row, prisoners that are on death row, often the day or the week before their execution will sweat blood. Interesting, right? That is the most common time for people to sweat blood. So he even says on the cross, like, forgive them for they know not what they do. You can sense the sorrow in him, right? It's the sorrow, but not for himself, for each one of us, right? Men hid their face or hide their face. We do this all the time. We hide our face from God because we don't want to be, you know, we want to see the truth. But think about Peter, right? What did Peter do? On the night that he was going to be crucified, right? What, or he was being put through all the trials. What did Peter do? do he remember? cut that dude's ear off. Well, yes, that's true. But later, right, what else did he do? He betrayed Jesus, Jesus three times, yeah. right? He hid his face. He denied him. He did not, yeah, he said, hey, no, 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 that's not me. No, 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 that's not me. No, 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 that's not me. Yeah, he Peter. hid. That was Peter. So he, he hid his face, right? Yes. Tyler. Wasn't it after the second time he had sat, uh, sat down and talked to him and said, you're going to betray me one more time? Uh, or, or was that when no, he, he just going to betray me three times? No, so he does say before it happens, he's going to betray him three times. Then the crow. Before the rooster crows. Right. And then the rooster crows, right? And the crows go, the crow of the rooster happens and he realizes, oh my goodness, he was right. Right? So, but we have men hiding their face, right? So this is Peter, right? This is, I mean, think about uh, even the Roman centurion at the cross. Right? He goes, this man was innocent. Right? We hide our face from the truth. So now here's here's the part. So we did not esteem him, right? So this is could be us, like we said at the very first, right? But guess what? Who is Isaiah writing to? Who is Isaiah? What is Isaiah a prophet? True, but he's part of the what church? No. He's part of what uh people? The Jewish. The Jewish people, right? So he's writing to the Jews. Jews, thank you. Yeah, so we did not esteem him. Literally, Isaiah is speaking to the Jews, calling them out for not accepting the Messiah. This is another reason why it can't be Israel. You see, people argue today, like modern Jews will argue that this passage is about Israel. That doesn't make sense. Israel doesn't accept Israel? That doesn't make sense. Sorry. It just completely conflicts with what the scripture is talking about here. So it cannot be about Israel. Doesn't make sense. Okay? Hey? Huh? So here's the deal. This is the only savior that you will get in the entirety of human history that is written about, but with the idea that his own people will reject him. This is unusual, right? So when you, when you look at other religious texts, it was always, there's this guy, he's going to come, he comes, he fulfills the prophecy. 
right? I'm say prof prophecy in, in quotes here, right? He comes and he's the, the savior figure and everybody loves him and accepts him. Jesus is the only savior that was predicted that was going to be rejected by his people. That's not something hum like we make up, right? If we make it up, he's this God figure, he's this great perfect thing and nobody hates him and everybody loves him. Why? Because it's history, right? This is prophecy which turned into history for us. It's just truth, right? That's, we get these conflicts of every, every, you know, every other human made religion has this falling out of, we're going to have, we're just going to build up this savior person and everybody's going to love him. But Christianity is the only one that says the savior is actually going to be rejected. And that's exactly what we see. It's unusual, right? Because it's prophecy. It's truth. It reads like history because it is for us. So Isaiah 53, four, can somebody read that for me? Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Mm -hmm. You want to read the next one for me? Let me pass that up to you. So uh, when we get there, he, he borne our griefs and our <laughs> sorrows. This is sin. You see, the Old Testament constantly refers to sorrows and griefs as from sin. Right? Like he has this sorrow, he has this grief, and it was always because of some sin that happened in that in that person's life. Right? So this is just again reference to sin. Right? So it's telling us this person's gonna bear our sins. <laughs> Yet we estreamed him stick a stricken, afflicted, or cursed by God. So we again, this is the Jews, basically claimed God hated Jesus. Can somebody pull up Matthew 27, 41 through 44 for me? Okay. So they claimed that God hated Jesus because God would have saved him from the cross if he was really God's son. And then also in scripture, if anyone is, is condemned to die on a tree, it was considered a curse, right? So Matthew 27, 41 through 44. Do you have that? Can I pass you the mic? Can we pass the mic to him and then you can read the next one off the screen? Can you pass that over here? All right, so Matthew 27, 41 through 44, please. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we believe in him. Till when? Uh, 44. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And robbers who crucified him uh, with them also revealed him in the same way. Reviled. Reviled. Yeah. So this is the story, right? He's on the cross and they're making fun of him. They're saying, if you're really the son of God, right, God would save you. But you're not. God doesn't like you. God hates you. You're a blasphemer. Right? This is exactly fulfillment of this prophecy. So, yes, he was cursed, but not by God. That was blasphemy for them to say that. Of course it was, yeah, but they didn't know that at the time. But he, so, yes, he was cursed, but not by God, by each one of us and our sin. The curse that was put on, the curse that was put on Jesus came from our sin not from God. So Isaiah 53, verse, oops, verse five. Can you, you want to pass that up to him so he can read that real quick? Yeah, up here in the front. No. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement what brought us peace. That brought us peace, excuse me. Mm -hmm. And his wounds, stripes, we are healed. Yeah, and so I put in, in uh, italics here in parentheses, stripes. So this word wounds here can also be translated as stripes. If you're reading like the King James Version, you'll probably have it as the word stripes. I, and I did that for a reason, and I'll explain that here in just a second. So, okay. So he was pierced, crushed for our transgressions and iniquities. You know, there's actually another prophecy that says the exact same thing. Zechariah 12, verse 10. Does anyone want to 
See if we can find that for me. Okay. Okay, in case you don't know what it is, it's in the Old Testament right before the new one. All right. Zechariah 12, verse 10. Yep. You got it? Can you pass him the mic? Almost. Um, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. You got it? Yeah. Sure. All right. You want to read that for me? 3, 4, 2, 11, 12. Um, yes. All right. Verse 10. Uh, it says, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn him, mourn for him as one mourns for another child, and weep bitterly over over him as he one weeps over a firstborn. That's it. All right. Yeah. This is another. As they pierced me, mm -hmm. this is God speaking. Right. They'll pour out over him. This is just over and over. I mean, clearly pierced. Right. We know Christ was pierced, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. Pure destiny. So chastisement that brought us peace. Jesus stands in the way of the justice that belongs to us. You see, we should have been chastised for our sin. We should have been made fun of, ridiculed for all of the things that we did wrong, right? In fact, sometimes we are, right? Think about it. Like how many of you guys have had people in your life that are just like, man, you're such trash because you did all this stuff, right? I have, right? And that it hurts when that happens. But think about now that happening from God. God's saying that to you, right? Jesus stands in the way and he says, you can put that on me, right? Chastisement that brought us peace. This is atonement. And if you guys don't know what the word atonement means, you can just break it down at one minute, right? Atonement. So it's being at one with God. Okay. Pretty cool. Easy way to remember what the word means in case you've never heard it before. <laughs> okay. So with his wounds, we are healed. Obviously his blood covers our wounding of God. You see, we damage God. We are at war with God, right? We are healed from these, <laughs> these wounds because of his wounds. So you're going to see three different kinds of, of like physical damage here, right? So we have pierced, crushed, and stripes. Right? And so that's why I use the word stripes there at the end with the wound. Okay? Because we have nails plus the spear. That's a piercing. Crushed. right? Many broken bones because he's beaten three times. And then stripes. This is the whipping. right? Stripes all down his back. This is, again, the details of these prophecies is incredible. Yeah. Well, more of the details, they were supposed to break his legs, but he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs, unlike everybody else. Oh, the other way around. So it, the, it says that he will not have any bones broken. Yeah. And so normally they would break bones, but he was already dead, so they didn't yeah, break his bones. Saying. Yeah, so that, yeah. yeah, it was a fulfillment of the prophecy. Yeah. Right. So all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So if we look at this, Right, all like sheep, we have gone astray. This happens in Luke, and I'm probably just gonna, I'm gonna have to pick up my pace here a little bit. So, unfortunately, I don't have time for for questions or looking up. So, Luke 15 verse four: What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? You see, this is us. We're we're sheep. Let's look at Romans 3.23. Does anyone know what that says? I mean, you don't, you don't have to look it up if you know. It's basically, it says, for all have fallen short of the glory of God, right? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So I'll read that just so we get it verbatim there. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
It's pretty close, <laughs> right? All like sheep, we have gone astray, right? This is, this is a, a judgment on all of us. So they laid the iniquities on all, of all of us on Jesus. He's the only way. All of our sins ended up on him. All of them. You see? We're going to read Isaiah 53, 7. Oops, sorry. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opens not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. So you see, he was oppressed and afflicted, but opened not his mouth. If we look at Matthew here, 26 <coughs> and 63, okay, we will find, all right, 26, 63. All right. So, uh, but Jesus remained silent and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. He remained silent. Well, where else does he remain silent? 27 verse 12. All right. And this is where he's in front of Pilate. But when he accused, but when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Luke. We're going to look Luke 23, verse 9. So he questioned him at some length. This is in front of Pilate, but he made no answer. He opened out his mouth, right? A lamb led to the slaughter. So this is the Passover offering. You see, when the Jews were in Egypt, right, right before they came out, the final plague was to kill the firstborn children, right? And so what were they supposed to do in order for their houses to be passed over by the angel of death? Do you Painting remember? The door. Painting the door with what? Lamb's blood. Lamb's blood specifically, right? And that's important. What is John chapter 1, verse 29? The next day, so this is John the Baptist. So this is John writing about John the Baptist. Two different Johns. Okay, sorry, it's a little confusing there, but... Be, the next day, he, this is John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and be said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So another person calling Jesus the Lamb of God. This is the same thing in 136. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, behold, the Lamb of God. No. And then 1 Peter 1. And so 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21, which for those of you who are in Bible study, we've been in 1 Peter, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. You see, that is the lamb of God, the Passover in Christ so that death passes over us when we put his blood on our, the doors of our hearts, right? Like when we accept his blood, the angel of death passes over. So by oppression and judgment, he was taken away and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. So you're going to get this over and over and over. So oppression and judgment taken away. They were trying to pass judgment. You know, people couldn't even agree when they were actually like in front of so the Jewish culture, when you went in front of a judge in the Jewish culture, you had to have two witnesses and they had to agree, right? Otherwise you were found innocent. But guess what? They couldn't even find two people to agree. Finally, the thing that they quote agreed on is that Jesus said, I can destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. But they lied. He didn't even say he could destroy it. He said, if you destroy the temple, I can rebuild it in three days, right? So they twisted his words and they lied about it. This is, a, he was taken away in judgment, but it wasn't real judgment. It doesn't, he doesn't defend himself as we saw earlier, even when they twisted his own words and that his death was a quote, judicial death. I mean, he was sentenced to death by the Romans, by the Jews as a punishment for the so-called sin. So cut off from the land of the living, this is used all the time as dying. Right? So he's, he's going to die. He's actually going to die. Right? So, and then he's stricken for our transgressions. He was beaten for our sins. This is, I mean, this is clear. 
right? Isaiah 53, 9, and they made his grave with the wicked. Now, this one is super cool. The details in this one is really cool. He made his grave with the wicked and with, and with a rich man in his death. And it seems to conflict, right? Like, how is that possible? Well, in Jesus, it is possible, and we'll find out. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. So, <laughs> grave with the wicked. He died with criminals, mm -hmm. right? Criminal on his left, criminal on his right. Yeah. But guess what? After he died, what happened? Matthew 27, 57 tells us that Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, comes. And this isn't, this isn't debated like, you know, people are like, oh, well, it says it in the Bible. No, actually, there are external historical resources that tell us this exact same thing. So Matthew 27, verse 57. Um, so here, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen and laid it in his own new tomb, where he had cut out the rock and rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. So grave with the wicked, he died with criminals. And then with a rich man in his death, it's extremely implausible that it's anybody else. You see, criminals were buried in mass graves back then. They didn't get a burial like you would normally, right? So for somebody to die with the criminals, but then be put into a tomb by a rich man, unbelievable coincidence to be anybody else but Jesus Christ, right? So this is Joseph of Arimathea and no violence. So Matthew 26, 53, um, you know, <laughs> This, I, I think this is funny. This is <laughs> Jesus himself speaking. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? You see, when he was on the cross, at any moment, he could have called down legions of angels and just wiped everybody off. What's a legion of angels? How many? It's, I don't remember the number, but it's like a thousand, I think. Yeah, or that's a core. No, it's a legion. It's yeah, a I think it's a thousand. Or yeah. it's, it's either 1,000 or 10,000. I can't remember yeah. off the top of my head. But we're talking thousands oh, of angels, right, coming down to potentially wipe out. Like he had the potential for violence. But yet there was no violence. So yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was put, he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. This is the Lord shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him and put him to grief. God willed it that his son died for us. See, that's hard to accept sometimes, <laughs> but that's the reality that we can say, you know, we put him on that cross and that's true, but God allowed it. It was God's will. In fact, what does John 3.16 say? So everyone, everyone should know that verse. Yeah, yeah. So God, so for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Oh, and yeah. Died for us. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have yeah, eternal right. life. Yeah, that was right? Yeah. It was God's will that he sent his son for us. You see, when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. So when he dies, he, God, will see him because he was resurrected. You see, so after, it's like when his soul has made an offer for guilt, so when he's died for our sins, then he shall see his offering. He being God in this case, will see his offspring. So he'll see Jesus, right? Why? Because Jesus was resurrected. And they will prolong his days and prosper his hand. He doesn't ever die again. And he's infinite life, right? So, he extends his life forever, right? He'll prosper his hand. When he returns, he will rule this earth for a thousand years. I don't know how much more prosperous you can get, right? Than ruling the planet for a thousand Satan, years. Right? No, no. Nope. This is Revelation chapter 20. And this is about Jesus. Okay. So 20 verse three. And uh, so this is, Satan is being, and threw him into the pit. So Satan being thrown into the pit and shut it and sealed it over so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. You see, so there's going to be a time of a thousand years where Jesus is on earth and Satan and all of his minions are locked away and can't bother us. Pretty cool. So now uh, we got two more, two more verses, two more verses. So out of anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. 
By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall be and he shall bear their iniquities. So make many to be accounted as righteous. So guys, this is literally the gospel. We needed him, Christ, to basically allow us to be righteous because none of us by ourselves are righteous. Second Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is Jesus. His innocence allows us to appear innocent in front of God. And you see, this can't be Israel. Right? Israel was never considered righteous, right? In fact, God actually writes a divorce paper for Israel. Did you know that? In Jeremiah, God actually says, yep, in Jeremiah, look it up if you, if you don't believe me. It's in Jeremiah. And it says, God, God says to Israel, I have written my divorce decree to you. He literally divorces Israel. Pretty cool. Wow. Right? New Testament and Old Testament theology are the same. Okay? This isn't two separate things. Okay? The entire Bible is one cohesive story. The fall and the necessity for something greater than man to come to save us from that fall, that decision that we made. You see, um, this one we're going to go over super fast because it's just repetitive, but I want to read it until, so we can finish and understand that anytime the Bible repeats something, it's because it's important. Okay? So therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So this is just repeating, means it's important, okay? It's 53 verse 12. Now, in conclusion, we get 700 years before Christ, we get this incredibly detailed prophecy that confirms the nature of the Messiah and what's gonna happen to him, right? Exactly what's gonna happen to him. You see, Jesus fulfills over 300 separate prophecies the likelihood of one person even fulfilling just eight of these prophecies is one in, well, you can see that number written out. It's but one in 10 to the 17th power. That's just eight prophecies, not all 300 plus. Okay, so that number is so big, we can't really conceptualize it. So let me help you conceptualize it. So if we take 10 to the 17th, that's that number, silver dollars. Okay, you guys are familiar with the silver dollars, right? Right? And you take them and you lay them face down, you will cover the entirety of the entire state of Texas in two feet worth of silver dollars. Okay, so now imagine your mind the entire state of Texas, two feet deep worth of gold of coins, right? These these are the uh, you know silver dollars, right? And then mix it all up and then put somebody in there and tell them. They have to pick the one right coin out of all of those. That's what we're talking about with just eight prophecies. You see how incredibly insane, let alone 300. That the entire world, 50 Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's considered, so uh, the math on that is roughly 10 to the 1,028th power, okay? There are not, as far as we know, enough like particles in the galaxy to account for that number. That's crazy. Okay, this is a mathematical impossibility for it to be anyone but Christ. And this is again, this is only eight of those prophecies. Okay, and if you want to look into this, this guy is named Stoner, and he's done this whole research that will give you more information. But I wanted to put that into concept that we could actually understand, right? So. God is real. The Bible is his inerrable word. It is the truth. So now, what do we do about it? This is Isaiah 53, 1. What do we do about this? What do we do about this servant dying for us? What will you do? You see? Guys, if we believe that this prophet, I mean, that's what Isaiah 53, 1 is calling us to action. I said that before, right? Hey, guys. Guys, can I, two more minutes, please? So Isaiah 53, one, 
already called us to action. Says, what are we going to do about it? And so today, I would ask, you know, I understand class is done, but if this in any way has impacted you, please feel free to talk to me after class or talk to, you know, I'm sure other guys here who are in the intern program um, and such that, or, you know, Gamboa or, or Mark or, you know, anybody you guys feel comfortable talking to because we're not talking about some random person in the entirety of history. We're talking about Christ the Savior who even in only fulfilling eight of these is so incredibly detailed, it has to be a God beyond human understanding. So um, I'll ask that if you've got your hat and uh, you're willing to remove it, we'll, we'll just say a quick word of prayer and then I'll dismiss you. Father God, I'm so grateful for your word. I'm so grateful for the truth of your word, Lord, and just the majesty of your word, how incredibly detailed that you make it so that we cannot possibly argue or deny that you sent your son to die for us. And then that son was Jesus Christ. The fulfillment of these prophecies, Father God, and the fact that there are even prophecies to begin with, just scream that God exists and that you are him and the Bible is your word, Father God, that it is true no matter how you look at it. No matter which angle you come at it, you will always find it to be true and rock solid. Father God, I am so grateful that you would use my mouth and my time to be your servant, to bring this message to these guys today. Father God, I, I pray that you impact each one of their lives, Lord, and bring them into relationship with you. Father, I pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus, who was pierced, crushed, and whipped for us. In Jesus' blood, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Did, did that stop?